Okay. <clears throat> So, um, uh, welcome heartily to all of you. I'm Arne Melker from the Center for International Economics and Trade at NUPI. Uh, today's seminar will be about state-owned enterprises and the trade war. Uh, it's part of a, a series that we will arrange in 2018 and 19 uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, global trade policy at the crossroads. Uh, we are also happy that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has um, agreed to sponsor the seminar series financially. Uh, we thank uh, the Ministry for that. Uh, uh, of course, the, the, the views expressed are those of the speakers and participants. Uh, I also uh, men will mention that this, the, these seminars are streamed online at NUPI's YouTube channel. So if you missed an argument, you can go back and see it <coughs> in the foreseeable future at the, the YouTube channel. Uh, so um, uh, we will announce further plans about the seminars uh, in 2019. This will be the last one in 2018. Uh, and uh, I think uh, today's theme is uh, a bit more technical than the last one about the trade conflict EU-China. Uh, where, where a bigger crowd uh, registered for the event, but this is a very key, it's a key issue in, in current uh, trade policy debates. Uh, at the heart of the matter is, of course, that, uh, that China is a country with a lot of state-owned enterprises, uh, and some uh, in the trade discussions about China and China's participation in the global economy, uh, the role of state-owned enterprises, their practices, their financing, etc., is a key issue. And at the WTO, uh, reform proposals are being presented or will be presented uh, that, um, that are uh, uh, addressing uh, the current conflicts. So it's a key issue internationally. Of course, we all know uh, from the national scenes that, uh, that uh, state-owned enterprise is, is also a political issue about the role of the state in the economy. So that's another sign of the story. And of course, uh, the theme that we are more used to uh, addressing in the domestic uh, debates. So, but today we will focus more on the international aspects. How is this addressed by in international agreements, trade agreements, the OECD, etc.? What kind of processes are going on? Uh, what are the implications? What is the role of the uh, state-owned enterprises in the world economy? Uh, which is slightly different, but of course has an interface with the domestic uh, debates. So, uh, to speak about this, uh, as the main speaker, we are lucky to have here Przemyslav Kowalski, who is president of the management board of S CASE, Center for Social and Economic Research in Warsaw. So, actually, CASE has been a cooperation partner of NUPI. We have, joined, have worked together on, on a project about regional, uh, about European integration. We are also currently working on project about the uh, trade defense issue uh, related to the EU. So we are very happy to have uh, 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 Dr. Kowalski here. He has um, <coughs> worked at the OECD for, for all 16 years, actually from 2002 to, uh, to uh, 18, uh, with a profound experience in this the field that he's going to speak about. So he has uh, published several articles about uh, state-owned enterprises, but also in a number of other issues related to international trade and investment. So, and published a number of papers uh, in, 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 uh, in related areas. So after uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Kowalski's presentation, uh, uh, Harald Andreasen, who is a, uh, a senior, uh, is a senior advisor at the trade policy section of the Ministry of, Affair, uh, of Foreign Affairs, to get the titles right, um, will speak about uh, uh, issues involved in uh, where Norway is involved in international processes relating to SOEs and, and comment on the issues generally. So, um, and uh, I can also promise that uh, uh, Dr. Kowalski has, has said he will write a policy brief uh, on the issue after the seminar, so we will also disseminate uh, uh, some of the content in, in the form of a for policy brief. So I'm then very happy to give the floor to Dr. Kowalski. Thank you, Arne. Uh, 
It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation to NUPI and to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, very glad to be here and to be speaking about one of my favorite topics. Uh, I don't work so much on this topic anymore, so any opportunity to come back to this is, is really great. Um, uh, currently, I'm at CASE, Center for Social and Economic Research in Warsaw. As Arna said, it's a think tank. Uh, it's a think tank that also works on projects for uh, various public, bo public bodies, including the European Commission, European Parliament, but we also have statutory goals of promoting good economic policies in the Central European region, Poland and the EU. Um, and uh, agreeing to this topic, I foolishly uh, took up uh, Arne's suggestion to talk about the trade wars as well as state enterprises. <laughs> but I realized actually it's 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 uh, it's it's nice to set it in this uh, in this format because the two are very uh, very much related. Uh, so without uh, much further ado, I will uh, uh, just go through. Uh, what I will present today, so that if you uh, if you lose me at some point, you have uh, an account. I will uh, say a few words at the beginning about the context of current trade tensions uh, and how I understand what's happening, because I think there's many different opinions about it and many diff you know uh, speakers and scholars have different takes on it. So I think it's important to explain where I am in my understanding of the current trade tensions. I would then later say a few words about how do state enterprises fit this topic of trade wars and trade tensions. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about what's the issue with state enterprises in operating internationally, so be it in international trade or investment, and specifically I will focus the, on the issue of state ownership. And as, as in, in, in the introduction by Arne, you may have noticed that Arne was speaking about state-owned enterprises. I don't have ownership in my title and there is a reason for it and I will explain why I don't have it. Uh, finally, we will talk a little bit about the spectrum of current policy approaches in the international arena. I will not talk about domestic policies, so for example, corporate governance of state enterprises. This is not the main part of my topic. I'm, to I'm talking about how they regulate it in the national international sphere, which is very different because it needs harder disciplines. Uh, and then we will speculate a little bit on what's, what's expected uh, in the future. So, coming to the trade wars, end of free trade, beginning of protectionism, we hear it all the time, uh, but I think it's important to reflect on what we're talking about. So, what is free trade and why is it important? And if you actually go back to the economic theory, you realize that any gains from trade, we know, I mean, trade is very intuitive. We gain from trading. But at the country level, when you actually go to the economic theory, Gains from trade are conditional on the lack of state distortions. It needs to be on the uh, private allocation of capital, entrepreneurship, risk-taking. Any basic theory of trade will show you that there are, if there are state distortions, you are not longer sure to have welfare gains from trade. You will have certain effects. You will have trade flows, but you may not have the gains from it. So, in order to have gains to dis distribute, you need to... You, you need to uh, have a minimum uh, amount or level of, of state distortions. If you have state distortions, you will have certain trade effects which will not be associated with welfare gains at the aggregate level and they may not be e uh, equally distributed either. So I think this, this issue of undistorted trade is a very important one. So then there is a question, was trade ever free? And in this optimistic period, you know, establishing the WTO, and the first years leading up to what we have now, the globalization backlash. Could we say a trade was, was freer, was going freer? And you could argue that it was going freer because the WTO was established to give uh, the teeth and the and, uh, secretariat to the previous gut structure. So this was a, uh, a, an improvement. This was also the time of the end of the Cold War. So former Soviet Union and centrally planned economies in Eastern Europe uh, started undergoing various reforms which were basically disassociating economic policy from the state and orienting it towards the market. You had all the BRICs, Brazil, Russia, uh, Indonesia, India, China, also engaging in all sorts of market-oriented reforms. So there was a, at the beginning of the 90s, you could see, you could, you could tell, there was a lot of privatization going on. You could tell the, 
the, the global economic system was going more towards the market. At the same time, soon after the establishment of the WTO, it was clear that there were a lot of problems. For example, the Doha development round of trade negotiations. It was very quickly uh, uh, quite clear that there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of policies that countries were not willing to uh, to uh, resign on, and this is why you know so in agriculture in some developed countries in non agriculture market access in some emerg maybe emerging economies it was quite clear that there was a lot of policies which were very important to countries, economic policies, and these countries were not willing to uh, to reduce them in the context of DDA negotiations. If you also see at the history of trade remedies, they peak at the beginning of the 2000s. So you see there was a lot of tensions in the world trading system already in the 2000s. So what I'm saying is that trade was going free, freer, but uh, there were a lot of uh, questions already in the 90s uh, and before. But so what happened then? There was the 2008-2009 crisis. Uh, what happened? There was a, well, it was basically, my understanding is that it was a financial market uh, originated crisis, but it had very quickly very real implications. So there was a lot of macro policies, uh, fiscal policy, monetary policies, stimulus. So in order to contain this stimulus, uh, countries also... Uh, resorted to certain policies that contain these stimulus. So, for example, local content requirements or certain procurement rules that basically distorted, closed off markets to, uh, to external influence, so to international markets. And but basically, there was a lot more state intervention in the economy. And different countries had different situations. Some countries were the originators of trade shocks. Some countries were recipients of trade shocks. So there was a lot of different approaches. And uh, there was a general lack of coordination of these policies, uh, also eroding a little bit the basis for coordination in the world trading system. Of course, there were the G20 pledges you know, the, against protectionism uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the crisis to avoid protectionism and to coordinate. But as is documented, for example, by the Global Trade Alert project, which is conducted by Simon Evanet at the University of St. Gallen, on average, each year, 400 discriminatory measures are being introduced by G20 countries, uh, while only 160 measures are liberalizing ones. So in general, over the 10 years, we had a big increase in, uh, in discriminatory measures. You could also look at the percentage of uh, government spending in GDP. Uh, in the, on the worldwide basis. Of course, it differs by country, but in general, it has increased, and in general, it has uh, replaced private investment. So there's a lot more government in the world economy, and if you actually look at, at certain specific countries, uh, this big government stimulus and interventionist policies resulted in stalled pro-market reforms. And you could take the case of China, where... Many people argue that actually uh, the SOEs grew back on the on the on the on the massive bailout uh, on the massive uh, macro stimulus uh, program China had in place at the time. They in fact they were vehicles of quasi fiscal policy. So the the stimulus was channeled through SOEs, and that resulted in various issues, including overcapacity and things like that. So my understanding is that. We have a lot more state and a lot less market in the global economy. And I see the current uh, trade tension a little bit as a recurring, recurring paradigm tension. And remember that these, these tensions between you know, proponents of economic freedoms and proponents of state interventions were always there. So if you th think of economic freedoms, you know, proponents of economic freedoms, they would say markets yield superior outcomes in terms of economic performance, and this is why you need to restrain state. So then you have institutions restraining state. Proponents of state intervention say, no, markets lead, lead to monopolies, crisis, unequal distribution of income. This is why you need state intervention. And then you have institutions restraining markets. Okay, so the WTO and the FTAs, which are consistent with the WTO by its Article 24, are designed to restrain states. So when you think, I mean, some people even, you know, joke about it and say the WTO, in fact, is a, 
Well, I mean, it's a, it's a cynical view. It's, a, it's, a, it's an institution to restrain what governments can do, but there isn't an equivalent institution on what the private companies can do. So when you look at the WTO, the WTO's approach is, is to leave the freedom to countries to manage their domestic economic policies as long as they don't distort trade. Okay, but what does it mean today with global value chains, all the little companies being a part of a bigger web of international cooperation trade? So what does it mean? Every single policy that has any real impact on any domestic market has some implication in some value chain. Uh, and in fact, the regulations, for example, some of the deep regulations about how we conduct business in the domestic economy have implications for international competition because the, the markets be, uh, became more contestable. So WTO has been designed to restrain states. And today, if you look at, the, uh, at China's performance in terms of trade and GDP share, China is, is, is set to overtake US as, a, as the largest economy in a couple or three or four years. So you have big, two big states, one predominantly based on the idea of free markets, and another big one on the scale, you know, China. You know, and uh, there's many reports documenting the extent of state intervention in the China economy, coexisting in one WTO. So the question is, can all these different countries with different approaches to domestic economic management, can they actually uh, be in the same WTO? Can they enforce the same trade rules? Okay, so my take of what's happening with the US and, uh, and China and in the larger context is that President Trump's China trade war is, okay, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant and uh, I would also be not a, a big, uh, big supporter of this, but it's just a symptom of a larger a long present tension. And if you actually look at the recent statements by the EU Commission, uh, you will soon realize that, and they actually say it explicitly, Cecilia Marstrom, who's uh, the Commissioner for Trade, they say they agree with the US on the diagnosis of the problem, they just don't agree on the means, on the approach, on the kind of confrontational style. Uh, but in fact, if it comes to the, to, the, to the assessment of the situation, it's the same. You also see trilateral statements by the US, EU, Japan in various fora on level playing field, trade distortions and forced technology transfer, uh, like-minded uh, statements. So there isn't too big a disparity with the US on this, with these countries. And remember in the past, even you know, during the Obama administration, we had TPP negotiations, which where uh, you know where they were called at some point the WTO uh, version two, uh, and then we had related to them uh, um, transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership, which were basically agreements, quite advanced agreements that were being negotiated to contain China. So, what we see today is a con is a, in a way continuation of what was there before. Will the WTO survive in this context? Well, I mean, it's, it, it can definitely survive if it can agree to the same more advanced common set of rules that will sat be satisfying to all the countries. Uh, we see there's a lot of um, rhetoric from the US. There's some proposals from the EU that go uh, towards meeting the US objectives. Uh, but the question is whether China will be able to support these, these, these reforms. And while up until now, China was playing a cooperative role in the WTO, you, you can see some statements from China recently that suggest that, that it's feeling like it's being cornered in the WTO and that, that uh, other countries are trying to put a straitjacket on China's economic policies. And this was recently the case at the APEC uh, summit where there was no joint communique. For example, and uh, I like the, the comment in the, in the British Guardian was saying that there was a mention to unfair trade practices in the text and the Guardian commented, you know, how guilty President Xi must have felt if he assumed that this was actually, uh, this, was actually uh, this, this, this statement was there to corner China and he didn't sign it. Uh, but obviously it's not just China, but it's China that didn't want to sign it. Uh, so what's the alternative? I mean, we've been seeing the alternative for a while now. It's the formation of, since the beginning of the WTO, we had a proliferation of regional and bilateral trade agreements. Uh, 
which are happening, you know, and the economists say it's second best because it's preferential uh, agreements. Yes, but it's preferential agreements with more like-minded countries, you know. So there is some economic rationale to the to the regional blocks that are forming, and they are forming. There is more than three hundred notified agreements now, and this is this is this is on the rise. Uh, so that's my uh, assessment of the of the current context. How do state enterprises relate to this? Relate to, uh, let me just uh, remind you. So my claim is that we have a lot more state uh, in the economy before the crisis and especially after the 2008-2009 crisis and that it's creating tensions in the context of economic paradigms and in the context of institutions. So state enterprises, this is, okay, the data is not very good on state enterprises, right? Because it's firm level data, usually these, uh, some, some, some of these state enterprises are not listed, so they're not very well documented. So to put together any kind of sensible trade or investment data on these enterprises is very hard. This is one of the, one of the, uh, the time series that could be put together relatively consistently, and it was done by, sorry, by my colleagues uh, um, uh, working for the investment committee at the, at the OECD. It's looking at the international mergers and acquisitions where the acquirer is a state, wholly state-owned enterprise from some country. So this is showing you the volume on this axis. This is the blue, the blue line, and the red line is showing you the share. So you see that you know from before the crisis where we had the share of SOE acquisitions in the global markets below 5%, we have them at 10% and going higher now. Okay, this is not just China, but China is a big share. This is the... Uh, the the red uh, the red uh, dotted line is the share of China in the in the global SOE acquisition, and the blue one is the volume. So you see this uh, when you see this peak is not accounted for by China. This is actually the ba the bailout of the UK banking system in 2009, RBS and uh, Lloyd's, TSB. Uh, so China, but China, if you look at the shares. China is, be is, is becoming to account for 40-50% of uh, global SOE acquisitions, which are on the rise. There's another figure, I, you will get the slides at some point. This is just showing you that this is actually, this, it's breaking it up to uh, emerging, uh, emerging and mature economies, and it's distinguishing between emerging economies with and without China and mature economies with and without the EU. So, for example, you see this is not just China. This is the emerging economies, in, uh, including China, and this is just China. So China is a part of it, but it's not just China. It's happening almost everywhere. And the EU, EU had this blip in 2009 with these bailouts, but it's, you know, it's, it's also on the rise, but it's, 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 it's much lower. So... What's the big deal with state enterprises being present in international markets? Well, as we said, you know, in the WTO and in the global context of trade agreements, we're agreeing to opening our markets to trade and investment on the presumption that it's based on, on market uh, mechanisms. So there is, a, there is an assumption that policies do not play too large a role in this trade and investment that we're opening to. But when you actually see the raising shares of state enterprises in mergers and acquisitions, in trade, in world tra turnover, you ask yourself, okay, these are clearly enterprises linked somehow to the state. So can I, to what extent is this assumption of policies not, policies not playing a role undermined? Okay, at the same time, there is not so much investment since the 2008-2009 crisis. So actually, the, the, the little investment that comes from the SOEs is also precious. So there's also an interest. So there's an interest in minimizing market distortions associated with state enterprise, but there's also interest in containing the unjustified protectionist policies. So for example, to prevent the kind of you know banning of SOE investment just because it's an SOE investment. And it's, we had some instances in, in some countries in the past. The bigger picture is that state enterprises are just one element. You know, there's a lot more uh, other trade distorting measures, subsidies, discriminate, discriminate, uh, discriminatory regulations, uh, 
public procurement that are not related to state enterprises, which are also important. So this is the, the larger context. Just a perspective of this review, and I should have mentioned it maybe a bit earlier, is that this is mostly the work uh, that I've been following or doing when I was at the OECD, and it's a particular perspective. Uh, even at the OECD, between the different committees, for example, trade, investment, competition, corporate governance, there are different views on what the problems associated with state enterprises may be. So, the but the trade, I think the trade context is quite interesting and neat because there is a WTO framework and it's quite advanced uh, and it's a it's a framework that that doesn't assume much about domestic policies but it says international sets international rules on these enterprises uh, just to just to say that we had a number of workshop at, uh, workshops at the OECD at the time of uh, um, negotiating a TPP and TTIP uh, including trade negotiators, academia, business, policy makers, lawyers. This was quite interesting. We also had some uh, OECD trade policy papers on it, and there were also some other. Um, there are also some other resources coming out of this. So, for example, business surveys, or some kind of attempts to codify regulations and policy approaches to state enterprises in different countries. There's also a lot more horizontal work at the OECD trying to put all the perspectives on competition, in, uh, investment, trade, corporate governance, steel, and other sectors together on these enterprises. But I'll be just summarizing some of these uh, these things. And I hope, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm still good. Okay, just to show you that regulating or thinking about these distortive effects of state enterprises is quite difficult. It's complicated. So here it's like a, it's a, it's a, um, it's just an example. You have a uh, an SOE uh, in one country B, let's say China, competing with a private enterprise in in the United States. And the modes of this competition, okay, first of all, they can trade across borders, you know, so they they, they are established in their markets, so they have to abide by the rules of the markets or jurisdictions where they are established and they trade across the borders, okay? Depending on whether these countries are in the WTO, this is covered by the WTO, or by a trade agreement, right? But it's also covered by their domestic regulations to a certain extent. Then they can also invest themselves. An SOE from China can invest itself in the United States. Okay, when it invests its itself in the United States, first of all, it goes in under a different regime because uh, depending on whether it's services or manufacturing, it's either covered by the WTO or not. For example, if it's a manufacturing firm establishing itself in the US, it's just a US registered Chinese firm. Of course, it has to abide by the US regulations, but some regulations can, some policies or mechanisms can escape because, for example, you know, certain mechanism of preferential financing may still not be captured by the U.S. law. U.S. doesn't have state aid, uh, strong state aid rules, for example. So, just to say that SOE can trade across borders, can invest itself in another jurisdiction, but they can also compete in third markets, which can be either part of the WTO or not, can be either part of a, of a bilateral regional trade agreement or not. So, this is already quite complicated because it, there is several jurisdictions, there are several different layers of international law, and this is not even mentioning global value chains, uh, in the sense that this state-owned enterprise can be either a provider of a final product or an intermediate input, and depending on and depending on kind of distortive uh, practices that may be in place, it can be, for example, subsidi subsidizing downstream. You know, for, so, for example, SOE is, is upstream of another company that's exporting to the U.S., and, and it's this mechanism that, that um, translates the kind of, let's say, support to this other enterprise that's competing there in the international markets. So it's all quite complicated. These are some of the... Uh, some of the uh, uh, concerns that have been expressed in the literature about state enterprises, but not also only about state enterprises, because any of these things has also been mentioned in the context of private enterprises. So you have preferential financing, so prov providing finance below the market uh, conditions, outright subsidies, grants, tax concessions, things like that, in-kind subsidies, for example, electricity, 
uh, cheaper electricity going to manufacturing in steel or in aluminium uh, sector. Gu uh, state guarantees, explicit or implicit, you know, sometimes it can be explicit state guarantees, but sometimes just being state-owned, you have an implicit guarantee because the banks know that you're state-owned, so they're going to give you better financing because you're safer. Price support, exemptions from bankruptcy, preferential regulations on many different fronts, uh, preferential treatment in, in terms of public procurement, and things, even soft things like, you know, access to information and commercial diplomacy support, you know, so for example, when a president of a country goes on a mission to China and then take, you know, 50 uh, CEO, CEO, CEOs, you know, on the plane with them, but why these CEOs and not the others, for example, this is, was always my question when I was looking at these things. Uh, but so to what extent this ownership perspective help in looking at this? So, there is a view of ownership, the ownership matters. And every time I hear this question, does ownership matter? And coming predominantly in the kind of capitalist uh, society system, it, I, I smile, of course, ownership matters, right? But taking it to state on enterprise level, you know, some people argue that ownership by state implies certain interests, rights, and obligation characteristic to an owner, and thus exertion of state influence or help or support may be more likely. So this is the approach in some of the newer free trade agreements. But some people say, and that would be, I would be probably uh, closer to this on this scale, but maybe even here, is that ownership doesn't, does not inevitably entail influence or, uh, and state control or otherwise state-influenced enterprises can have very similar effects. So where to draw the line? So for example, I can have a minority-owned enterprise or even totally privately-owned enterprise, which is a national champion which is supported by state. So this is, the, this is where they own, you, you realize that actually defining it just by ownership, you're missing, missing out. So in general, and this is the WTO approach, governments can influence behavior of different kinds of enterprises in a variety of ways, subsidies, discriminatory regulations. So why not focus on specific kind of distortions rather than ownership? And this is the WTO approach, okay? So just to recap, this is, this is the kind of spectrum of current approaches to regulating uh, state enterprises in the international scene. At the WTO, which is in principle ownership neutral, we say every enterprise is the same, and we, the WTO rules are there to constrain the actions of state, which could be discriminatory. So the WTO rules discipline discriminatory government behavior that can involve any enterprise. Okay, that's quite clear. If discriminatory behavior by state enterprise is suspected, it emphasizes the ability to demonstrate formal links with the state. So you need to demonstrate that this enterprise that may be discriminating in the markets and creating trade distortions is linked to the state. And this was actually, this has been a problem in the WTO in the sense that it's quite hard. You know, the kind of WTO uh, case law that exists, when you read it, it's actually quite clear that there is no clear rules on how to establish which enterprise is linked to a state. Because, for example, one of the rulings says that it needs to be considered in the political context of a country, you know. So every country has got a different approach to what means, what government means in this country. Okay, the preferential trade agreements that have been flourishing in the context of the WTO they are different. They put increasingly emphasis on defining by strict criteria. So, for example, 50% of the votes or 50% of the board belonging to the state means state enterprise, and then explicitly committing these enterprises which are seen as part of the state not to discriminate. So it doesn't mean discriminate against these enterprises. It just means that they are covered by the same rules in, the, in, in these agreements as governments are, so they cannot discriminate. Okay? And you see this, this kind of approach in many preferential trading agreements, in, in, many of those including the EU, but obviously the, the US was a big proponent of this and the TPP. Another class of agreements that, that's there is the investment agreements. But this is a different class, and we, do, we actually 
we actually covered this in one of the papers showing that it's a totally different legal tradition. It's about investment protection once you invest it. It's not about competitive rules. So there's no rules on enterprises who are coming to your market. They are just protected under certain conditions when they've already invested in your market. But this in investment, international investment architecture is basically resulting in the possibility of governments to discriminate pre-establishment. So before you come to my country, I can screen you, I can demand from you. And once I let you in, you're protected, but I don't have to let you in. The WTO is very different. The WTO says, okay, we all commit not to discriminate, but I'm going to let you in. So I cannot discriminate you on the, on the kind of ad hoc basis. So this is where we have this national inward investment regimes, which increasingly have ownership-specific tests and requirements, including the, the proposals, the recent, relatively recent proposals by the Commission to have such a regime in Europe. Okay. I think I'm, uh, I'm already talking a bit long, but uh, this is just um, recapping the WTO, strengths and weaknesses of the relevant WTO disciplines. And so, as I said, WTO already covers uh, all the policies that advantage or support state enterprises or private enterprises. That, that's, that's not a big issue. State enterprises as extensions of government. So this is the issue of public body in the... So we, which enterprise can be seen as a, as a public body, so as an extension of government, and therefore it should be uh, subject to stricter rules than other enterprises. So that's a big, that's a big thing. Another thing is the, uh, the services area, where there's no rules on subsidies in services in the WTO. So whatever is covered here, for example, in manufacturing, doesn't cover services. And some uh, some uh, scholars uh, claim that actually subsidies in the services sector are much larger than in the manufacturing sector. So services are, are exempt, and the services regime is a bit is a bit different from manufacturing regime in the, the WTO. It's more similar to actually investment uh, treaties regime, where you uh, where basically the governments, the recipients of FD, uh, services related FDI, for example agree not to discriminate against these companies that come. But it's not, it's, not, it's not covering discriminatory actions of these state enterprises that may be invested in, investing in your economy to a great extent. So there is a question of whether in the WTO the ownership can be a, future, a useful criteria for determining relationship with the state. Uh, there is also a question of transparency. Notification of subsidies, notification of state enterprises this has always been a problem at the WTO, and uh, it's been raised in the literature. And the, the question of services, how to cover services. This is what's uh, recapping what hap what's happening in trade agreements. Usually you have a clearly defined entities who are then subject, so either by ownership, control, you also define commercial activities, so for example, Enterprises engage, state enterprises engaging in commercial activities are different from state enterprises engaging in non-commercial activities. And so the, the commercial ones, they are the ones covered by, by the kind of uh, uh, market-oriented rules. So you have definitions, you have explicit statements that these enterprises which are defined here cannot discriminate uh, either in terms of uh, MFN rules or national treatment, uh, you also have special provisions saying that advantages to and by uh, state enterprises are prohibited, and you have definitions. So, for example, non-commercial assistance, injury, adverse effect, this is all defined in, more of the in some of the more advanced agreements. You also have some rules on competition. So, for example, that state enterprises... Uh, cannot engage in anti-competitive uh, and monopoly uh, practices. They have to, uh, they have to follow commercial uh, considerations. So they need to be profit-oriented, and what not. And last but not least, you know, transparency. A very extensive transparency provisions in the preferential trading agreements. Some examples. Uh, this is an example on the of the EU. I'm not going to go through uh, the details of it, but the EU itself is a very advanced uh, international trade agreement in the sense that it has state aid, competition, and transparency provisions, and it's an ownership-neutral system. 
so it's 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 built on the on the tradition of the WTO, but effectively, you know, every s subsidy you know that you give, you have to approve. You know, it needs to be state aid approved. So obviously, there are it's not bulletproof, but it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a very advanced system of competition and subsidy policy that that seems to be working. But then in in their trade agreements, the EU has got very different approaches you know and it, it's using it it seems to me that it's using everything that is available there and it can work in a certain context so for example eu ukraine is very close to state aid because uh, the ukraine will be covered by eu state aid rules and there will be a special state aid commission that will be monitoring this then you have ttip which had very uh, several uh, provisions similar to tpp at the time you have EU Vietnam, which is a bit more basic, but it also has some transpa interesting transparency provisions. And then you have some more traditional ones. For example, CETA doesn't have much, but Canada, uh, you could argue, is not a big problem on state ownership, although some provinces have some uh, state owned enterprises there. But the US, I think the US, I'm not going to talk a lot about the US here, but the US is really interesting. On state enterprises, if you look at the Chapter 17 in Trade uh, Trans uh, Pacific Partnership Agreement, and if you look at the new U.S. Mexico Canada chapter and SOEs, they are exactly the same. It's a copy and paste, 25 page, uh, 25 page uh, chapter, really uh, re elaborate definitions of SOEs, non-commercial assistance, injury, adverse effect. So this is showing you that the SOEs are there and they will be a part of future uh, U.S. Uh, uh, trade agreement agenda. Okay, this is just on investment, but I, I already said a few things. So, uh, what can we ex expect in terms of new uh, disciplines and actions? So, in, in the area of trade, and I am distinguishing between an area of trade and investment because I think they're quite different. So, we have the WTO framework, but it's being kind of overtaken or, you know, led by consistent with it preferential trading agreements but they have a very different approach because they 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 don't up, uphold the ownership neutral one but they define SOEs and they have more more extensive disciplines so WTO reforms we've seen the EU proposal uh, of the WTO reform which actually has a section on rules subsidies and it has a specific mention of state owned enterprises where this issue of public body to when can I treat a certain state enterprise as an extension of government as a top objective of defining this? So I think that's that's a very uh, that's a very good proposal, um, and I think we can expect a stricter application of other existing WTO rules, including on subsidies. So, for example, subsidy notification, uh, and also uh, including the subsidies that involve public bodies and and whatnot. Uh, but the big a big uh, common the nominator of all these new initiatives is transparency. So I expect that at the WTO and in the different trade agreements uh, and at the OECD APEC, there will be transparency exercises which will be trying to gather information on specific enterprises, how they link to the state, how they govern, uh, to be able to assess to what extent they actually pose a problem. Investment is very different. It doesn't have the WTO equivalent. So it's a bit of a uh, of, of a jungle uh, there. It's less predictable. It's unregulated pre-establishment, so it means that there is no conditions pre-establishment. So I can also discriminate against SOEs, and I would expect that there will be, you know, uh, countries will be taking, uh, uh, you know, will be using this to to screen uh, state-owned enterprises and state enterprises investing in their economies. And I just put at the end some on transparency, which seems to be a concern that cuts across the different views of state enterprises, some of the elements that would need to be there as the element as 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 part of this transparency uh, mechanism uh, for it to work. So we need to have definitions compatible with the ones used in trade and investment agreements when we count state enterprises. We need to have complete and accurate list of SOEs. We need to have a complete documentation of measures extended to, to these enterprises, but also measures extended by these enterprises to any other entities. Uh, 
and we need a lot more information on corporate governance. But if you actually read the Norwegian Norwegian annual report on state enterprises, it's pretty close to this this standard. Apart from the fact that it doesn't go into the you know showing exactly where the support goes, but though it shows to what companies and for what purposes, so it it's as close to the standard as it as it comes. And I just put a matrix of uh, pre prepared by the OECD how you can actually classify the different forms of government support going to any enterprise along the production function, so whether it's going to, towards labor, capital, inputs, or whether it's subsidizing income of the company, and then how it's done. And in principle, you can, you can use this. This matrix has been used for the agriculture support uh, measurement, but it's now being used, for example, in some sectors of concern, such as aluminum and steel in the OECD context. So I'd like to finish on uh, that and uh, thank you very much and I have some uh, supplementary slides if you want to engage in discussions later on. Thank you. <clears throat>Deeply impressed by the uh, research-based research uh, picture you provided, uh, Dr. Kowalski, and uh, a very rich, intriguing, intriguing presentation it was. I think I would be slightly more practical, perhaps, in my approach. Um, this is not the right. Can I ask you? Sorry for this. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> so I just want to share uh, an outline of my comments. Uh, I'm, I will uh, comment on how the issue of SOEs relates to the WTO rulebook and also on current processes uh, that we are observing and that may lead to new disciplines somewhere, sometime. And I um, thought it would be a good idea to, to uh, start out with context uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, we do see um, uh, a lot of processes there. I think I will, to save time, focus perhaps on uh, on uh, one particular that we see the contours of. and and perhaps uh, of better interest to you, the uh, Norwegian perspectives to this, uh, uh, to the developments that we are observing. Yes, I think uh, the, the context uh, is uh, already there uh, on the top of the mind of everyone. We know all these cartoons we've seen, uh, pictures of uh, various uh, heads of state on the front pages, uh, I don't, I'm not here to characterize uh, uh, the situation. The trade war is uh, part of the, <coughs> of, of the, uh, of the narrative. Um, it's clear, clearly uh, a situation where there is uh, uh, huge tensions between the US and China. And, um, uh, we we have learned, of course, that this uh, this has to do with the business practices. Uh, they are not fair, and uh, been uh, mentioning of a non-market economy uh, behavior. And we have seen uh, the issue of SOEs, uh, the role of the SOEs, the behavior of the SOEs mentioned, uh, subsidies, part of it, and also overcapacity, and. Uh, 
And I think that is uh, uh, perhaps the situation here that, ha uh, here that has triggered uh, some sort of um, initiatives, we may say, from, from, the, from the US. Um, I think, in fact, it has uh, triggered a lot of efforts uh, around the globe, so to speak, uh, to, um, to um, do something about this problem. And I think many of these efforts now fit into a heading we may call modernization of the WTO. And uh, Norway is part of that uh, as well. We, uh, our minister participated when a group of uh, 13 WTO members met in Ottawa this uh, autumn to, to discuss uh, various things. I just wanted to just to, to uh, give one quote from the from the statement uh, that came out of that meeting, just to to give a little bit of the flavor. They uh, they all signed on under the deeply concerned they are by the recent developments in international trade, particularly the, the rise in protectionism, which negatively affect the WTO and put the entire multilateral trading system at risk. Uh, and there was also there in, in that statement, in fact, the reference to rules must also be updated to reflect 21st century, <coughs> 21st century realities. And also part of it, Im improved notification and transparency of uh, domestic measures. I, I just mentioned that also just to provide a little bit of the context. I think we've We've seen, as I said, many initiatives. We've seen, uh, for instance, EU proposal that came this summer, mentioned by, by you. We've seen uh, hard work doing uh, on the basis of, of the G20, uh, steel group, a lot of work also in the, in the, in the OECD. And um, uh, I would say perhaps because of the composition of uh, of that trilateral group. I mean, three uh, influential uh, members of the WTO um, meeting to see how how they can um, how they can um, influence, so to speak, that uh, process based on, uh, again, what they are saying, concerned with the non-market-oriented policies of third countries. Uh, they are they stated in May, uh, the ministers, they're discussing possible measures that could be undertaken in the near future. And um, that is uh, a process that is, uh, uh, I think, uh, a process that is re there is a re reason to, to follow closely. And uh, I don't, in, under the category of other initiatives, I think it's also fair to say, I know from my, my early life uh, when we were in, uh, quite active in, in negotiating a TISA agreement, a trade and services agreement, we had proposals there on SOE disciplines, and we know that uh, the TPP uh, at the time, uh, when all the negotiating members were part of that effort, also had uh, SOE disciplines as part of the, of the agreement. And we also know that that is also covered, uh, I think, in the update of the North American uh, three-party Agreement. Uh, that's a new acronym, but uh, <coughs> but uh, that is perhaps part of the picture, part of the context. Uh, I I think that my comments will will of course be a little bit uh, influenced that we are in an early phase. I mean, we are still trying to get the picture. We are <coughs> we are in uh, some sort of effect finding uh, phase. But I think it's good to have as a reminder the one basic uh, assumption for our work, and that is, without even even asking specifically the Norwegian industry, we know that they are 
as they are exposed to uh, foreign competition, uh, they are, uh, as a matter of principle, uh, in favor of open markets because uh, that is what it takes to create opportunities. Uh, and uh, and uh, also a reminder that uh, the predictable market access is in the core, and also that uh, this work is uh, is based on the principles of non-discrimination to the largest possible extent, uh, of course. And I think maybe that is where we can see, I mean, any harmful measure that is distorting uh, markets is a source of concern from that perspective. And, uh, and the subsidies and, and the issues that we're discussing here are part of that. Just uh, a reminder. So, um, how does this um, uh, problem relate to the WTO rulebook? I think the, the, that is uh, what we have in the rulebook is the, the at the center of, of, of the W2 uh, rulebook is the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. And uh, just to, as a point of reference, so to speak, to uh, just uh, give some highlights. This is on uh, uh, applicable on trading goods. And uh, subsidies are uh, disciplined in a way they are either prohibited or they are actionable. And actionable is, of course, it's up to each WTO member to countervail a subsidy if, uh, if that subsidy is causing injury to your own industry. And uh, I can just say in brackets, uh, Norway is not a member that is uh, practicing this type of... Uh, of measure, I mean the, the countervailing measure. Uh, there is um, a situation there where most subsidies are actionable. I mean, only export subsidies are uh, are um, uh, in the category of of, uh, of uh, being prohibited. So the focus here is on what the importing member can do in his own market, and that's a countervailing duty as an action. Uh, but there is also an alternative remedy, and that is more the traditional uh, route, uh, where you go through the processes of, of consultation and, and, uh, and having a panel at the end to look at, at the practice. So that is the overview of what's in the rulebook. And then we, we can observe just, not because I have you know, the to-do list of where we will work, but just simply just by merely observing. Uh, oops, sorry. There is, in real life, not a lot of focus on market distortions outside your own, your domestic market. So this is uh, something that is we can observe. I mean, any third markets or the home market of the subsidizing uh, member is um, is uh, is not uh, in, in focus. Uh, and uh, just maybe uh, at a little bit at the detail level, uh, subsidies from SOEs as such is not. Uh, disciplined, only the public bodies, and this is uh, also linked to the to the case law as it has been developed in the, the WTO dispute settlement. And as also observed, uh, I mean, there is not much on trade and services on specific subsidy disciplining. Uh, but there, it should be added that due to the very concept of how you trade and services, you could do it uh, on the basis of, uh, I would say, equal treatment. So there is a focus on all the measures of the importing member. So subsidy is, in, in principle, any of those measures. So if you have a subsidy scheme that is uh, favoring, uh, I would say, the industry of the import, importing uh, member, then
you are in principle uh, uh, covered and disciplined, but then it depends on what specific commitments, of course. And I think many, many WTO members, at least Norway, we have uh, to a large degree committed on that specific trade and service that go through establishment. So then uh, I think that is how the trade and services uh, rule book look. And, and also I could add uh, there is not much on investment perspective and there is nothing on competition policy, just uh, uh, the negative. I, I think I, um, I mentioned that just by the, the way uh, the, the three relatively influential WTO members are, uh, are coming out with statements. Uh, this so-called trilateral process is worthwhile uh, uh, following. Uh, they are repeating uh, language on, on the, the, the securing a level playing field uh, given the challenges posed by third parties developing SOEs, international champions, and setting them loose in global markets. Uh, but then I said that uh, in, uh, in this context, uh, strengthening the rules is important as, as, uh, as a remedy. And they are then stating industrial subsidies and SOEs. And they want to address market distorting behavior and confront particularly the harmful subsidies. Uh, and here they are relatively br uh, detailed in the listing of what, what they are looking at. And I, th I thought that was worthwhile uh, uh, mentioning. Uh, and we can see here uh to me this this looks like uh, being uh, comments on on uh, still on improving the uh possibly the agreement on subsidies uh, with the, with the, with the scope as is i mean we we have the focus on industrial subsidies and um and th this may be descriptions of of uh, versions of subsidies that are deemed to be particularly harmful. And the aim is to, uh, to be able to come out uh, inside that group uh, by the end of this year. And it's uh, clearly stated that the intention is to, to seek uh, a startup of, of uh, uh, negotiations. So that is uh, one of these initiatives that we are uh, following. So uh, again, um, some basic uh, perspectives as seen from uh, from Oslo. Uh, it, of, of course, w the basic <laughs> perspective is, of course, that we are, as you all know, no need to repeat. We are an open economy, and we are relying on well-functioning trade rules. Um, and we are ready to take part in a discussion in the WTO on how to address the sources of trade distortions. Because we feel uh, this is, uh, like for any WTO members, this should be a common responsibility to, to update the, the rule book uh, when needed. Uh, complex problem, yeah, I think uh, one uh, hint was on, on, the, on the complex value change, change that we see today uh, in, in, the, in the world trade. Uh, so production, of course, is of, of goods, goods sold in, in any given market is, is something that you can see can take place in various other uh, members' uh, territories. But Still, uh, it's not always the case. Of course, you can have all those complex value chains inside one member if the member is 
large enough. I mean, so but still, it's uh, it's complex. I think uh, one important perspective uh, seen from um, from uh, from Oslo is, I mean, when we speak of an uh, Norwegian industry that's used to uh, meet foreign competition. We include, without uh, reflecting also on our SOEs, because they are operating independently and, and they are basing their, uh, their decisions, their strategies on, on, commercial, on a commercial basis. And, and so this is the, uh, why we, uh, I think, would like to know a little bit more of what is the SOE problem. I mean, it cannot be uh, about the label. I think you had uh, many uh, interesting points on, on the nuances we need here. Uh, somehow we have to look through that and, look and focus on the, uh, on the harmful uh, behavior. And uh, I think it's an important part of that observation that uh, if, if you can make sure that business environment in your jurisdiction is so that you have uh, a genuine operation of, uh, of a company on market terms and uh, on arm's length uh, of government, then you have no distortion. Uh, uh, and of course, next uh, step is perhaps to look deeper into it, but not uh, as such. So uh, we are ready to to engage in a in a discussion. Uh, it's not easy to to give any timelines on where we stand, but we at least noticed the intentions of uh, of the trilateral group of U.S., EU, and Japan, and we believe that that would uh, inspire the, the the pace of uh, of activity. Uh, and we um, we see that they intend to to, to launch that uh, uh, with the aim of having uh, some sort of uh, WTO based discussions, and we will of course be there and to to uh, to work for the Norwegian perspectives. And at this stage, it's uh, far too early to say uh, anything about possible outcomes, of course. I mean, it's <laughs> far too early, but we just know as, uh, as a general methodology that this may be uh, pluri uh, no, sorry, multilateral, meaning a full WTO rulebook revision, all, all members' part, but that may be a longer-term perspective than perhaps what may be a, an attractive shorter-term uh, solution is to have the, uh, all those on board that will constitute, constitute a meaningful uh, group of uh, WTO members, and that is when they call it the plurilateral agreement. So uh, I think, yeah, that's where we are. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Andreas, and we have time then for uh, some, uh, some uh, questions and a discussion. Uh, let me... Uh, let me uh, uh, ask one question to each of the, uh, of the speakers first, and then I uh, uh, open for the audience. So um, you will sit there, or shall we take a chair up, maybe? Is it better? Yes. Maybe we uh, put a chair here? Yes, I think so. I cannot. Yes, yes, OK. So yeah, so so to uh, Dr. Kowalski, the, um, uh, the one issue is about um, uh, I mean, what is uh, what are the issues related to China? For example, in the metal sectors, in steel and, uh, and aluminium, one issue that has been kind of brought up well, is the access to to uh, to preferential funding financing. Uh, so uh, so uh, so to to make it kind of uh, concrete or, or specific. Is that a problem, and what is the problem with it? Uh, is it uh, because there are it's, this is not 
uh, covered by the rules, or is it bad that uh, the rules are not followed, or that it's difficult to prove <laughs> that the rules are? What is the problem with kind of concessionary funding to SOEs? Okay. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, how big of a problem it is? I think it's it's hard to say, but I think some some of the um, studies of specific industries that you mentioned, uh, steel, aluminium, and some others, show that it's quite a quite a significant problem. Maybe uh, on a par with the with the problem of subsidizing inputs. So, pro for example. Financing is definitely a problem. It came up in, uh, in Rita, I need to fix your microphone because the people at home won't hear this. Yeah. There. So I start again. Yeah. All right. Okay. So the issue of preferential financing is uh, is definitely uh, important. It came up in, uh, in in a number of sectoral studies of support. Uh, it's probably as important as the issue of. Uh, subsidizing inputs into production. Um, it came up also in some WTO disputes where indeed, I don't fully remember the details, but indeed there was an issue of uh, state-linked banks providing uh, financing or loans at, uh, at, at terms which were deemed by others as not, uh, not following the market. Uh, and indeed this w these were the cases where it was quite hard to establish or to argue that a state-owned bank uh, was actually following the policy of the state and providing cheaper financing to these companies. This was actually in the steel sector, I think, some of the disputes in the WTO. Um, uh, so the issue was to prove that these banks were public bodies, and with the current rules of the WTO, uh, it's not so easy. And this was, in, in fact, involving the U.S. and uh, and I think you know some of the rulings at certain stages were not very satisfactory to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So to Mr. Andreasen, um, let's say that you were uh, you have been heading the TISA negotiations earlier for uh, some years. So let's say that in some future negotiation uh, about TISA or by uh, in a free trade agreement with uh, USA or Japan or uh, they come with. Uh, the TPP SOE chapter, 25 pages. Would you sign it? <laughs> uh, it's a, of course a hugely complex question. So, so it kind of a, just a, a kind of impress, impressionist uh, uh, response. Uh, the, the easy answer is first of all, I would never have authority. I think <laughs> <laughs> to sign in any event, and then of course the first thing would be to read read it. And to understand uh, where the teeth are and uh, how they have been able to uh, reflect uh, the necessary nuances. Because I think where we come from, as I said, to label something an SOE is not uh, the same, equal, uh, does not equal distortive behavior. Uh, so I think you have to do that part of the job and if necessary. Uh, do some strikeouts uh, in uh, in the draft. <laughs> I'm just looking at one of the team members from the TISA negotiations. Okay, uh, okay, mm. thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, uh, of course mm, yes, it's a complex question, but thank you very much. So I think th then we have a very qualified audience. So the floor is open for questions. Yes, okay, please and state your name also. My name is Vincent Barr. I'm the uh, vice chair for the Republic of Sombrad, Norway. I have a question for the both of you. I was very interested in the fact that the SOE thing seems to be something that everybody's concerned with. So my question would be, from your perspective, doctor, are the Norwegians in their uh, structure of how they run uh, business, state to business, are they part of the problem that we see, the Americans see, with China? And to you, Mr. Minister, uh, how are you different how is it, it's because it sounds so much similar to the problem he outlined. How would you be different other than the fact that you think that you're different? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who wants to respond? I can relate to what you <laughs> said. <laughs> yes. Start. Uh, 
I think uh, you know the the answer to your question is no, no, no way wouldn't be. And in fact, you know, relating to uh, Anna's previous question, I think I've I've read the the TPP chapter a few times and tried to study the different details and and it does mention services and investment just in one in one mention. And I think no way, just looking at how it reports and all the detail they reports on the state owned enterprise, how it divides them to those that are listed and only have commercial uh, and kind of return purposes, though that, that basically no way divides their SOEs to different groups and is very transparent about it. Um, and it shows that the, these uh, enterprises don't receive support that is not available to other uh Market participants, I think I don't think Norway would have any problem signing TPP kind of chapter, and this you know answering your question, no Norway would definitely be not on the in the spectrum of the U.S. problems. It would rather be a, a solution, in the sense that Norway's example is very often used in how you even when you have a relatively big state sector, is how what you can what you can uh, do to manage it properly okay so Norway has a big state sector but it's it's, it's making sure that it's it's is not uh, not playing by the rules that's my reading at least that was a lot of words to say to say okay maybe no it said no okay uh, you have so uh, yes. uh, from my perspective I have no uh, experience that uh, uh, those we are collaborating with in in in, in uh, various processes uh, are mixing uh, what is part of the prob description of the problem and and the, the Norwegian SOEs because there are some very very important uh, characteristics here. I mean, all the figures, the numbers uh, going in and out of a company that it's full. Uh, transparency about it, and the, the governance is also uh, sub subject to uh, standard rules and all uh, transparent, transparent, and also the links, the form, the links between the owner and the company is also uh, following all the formal rules, and I think these are the most important characteristics when we can state. The, the, the Clearly, that our our SOEs they are operating independently and they do so on a commercial basis, and I think that is a feature that is uh, recognized by our um, our uh, what you say uh, partners in in the discussions that we've had so far, and uh, well, it's of course an important thing that we maintain that uh, that uh, nuance. Okay, let's we uh, are there other uh, comments questions from the audience? Could I have a follow up? A brief follow up briefly, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so if the Norwegians are not a problem with their SOEs and the WTO is uh, it's just fine with them, how do you explain the size and the scope of the Norwegian uh what do you guys call it officially, uh, the, the oil fund? That, that, that seems to be state money through state-sponsored companies that end up with the state. Can I just answer very okay. briefly? Uh, uh, no answer, because I'm not here to discuss that yeah, issue. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> so, uh, I think, uh, are there any questions? If not, I will ask another question to both of you about what are the uh, appropriate fora to pursue the negotiations on this. Uh, for example, let's say on steel, which uh, is a very important um, uh, sector where the role of state-owned uh, enterprises or state enterprises has been a key issue. Uh, there is the OECD process and there were kind of signals that this was about to succeed uh, and the USA says uh, maybe not, uh, they are not convinced. So, so um, which are the fora that you need to solve the issues here? Uh, is it, uh, uh, can, uh, will the OECD be able to 
handle it. I think you are out of the OCD now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, or uh, and uh, is it too complex for the WTO to really handle these issues? Do you have to do it in more narrow form? Yes. I think um, I think the, the work at the OECD is useful in putting some numbers, figures, facts on on the on the issue uh, I mean so the for example the sector initiative like the global forum on steel it's dealing with a very specific sector which has its specific problems related to the nature of the sector and whatnot so it may be not the conclusions from it may be not generalizable to other sectors but it definitely this work is providing a lot of interesting information on the on the problem I mean I think I think uh, I think what was mentioned by uh, by my colleague here, is that uh, you know the WTO is probably the reference point for everyone. But uh, if not everyone can agree, then you have this plurilateral approaches where you have a group of like-minded countries, uh, and they get together, they agree on something, and then this agreement is is there to be exceeded by others. Um, but also we see that I mean the most action on SOEs has happened in in preferential trading agreements. So. Uh, I mean, now you will have the U.S., uh, Canada, Mexico agreement, where, where you will have the t essentially the TPP chapter on SOEs uh, adopted there. Uh, you have several EU agreements, uh, so it, it 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 seems it seems that WTO is the first best, but uh, the regional trade agreement will also be an important forum yeah, for this. Okay, then we have a question over there. Yes. My name is Lars Armklopp from the NVGL. First of all, thank you very much for a very good um, and uh, well-presented uh, uh, insights. Uh, I had a question building on uh, the discussion you, in, uh, you started now in terms of how to move forward. Um, uh, what is your assessment? And maybe others in the room would also have uh, assessments in with respect to the likelihood of the elephant in the room, engaging in any discussion, be it plurilateral or multilateral in the WTO. And uh, I guess you have guessed which elephant I'm referring to, uh, China. Uh, is there any chance of China taking part in such uh, discussions? Thank you. That's a clear answer to this. Okay, yes, and Dick Fletcher, yes. And the, the microphone, yes. <coughs> Benedict Fletcher, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I wanted to follow that one up because you mentioned, um, you mentioned the guidelines that the OECD has also uh, made regarding both SOEs on the one hand and, and more corporate governments on the other. And I was wondering if you could say something about, again, uh, whether you could formulate relatively general in the sense of rules that are encompass both SOEs or state enterprises as you preferred, and generally, enterprises, whether whether uh, liability companies or private companies, um, and and because they were so specific regarding uh, the transparency that is needed regarding operations for all companies, whether one could circumvent the issue of state enterprise by saying we need more transparency rules regarding both uh, companies in general as well as whatever, call it interference, but that, that the governments do impose on, for example, when we were talking about uh, financial, preferential financial uh, uh, lending and so forth. And, and, and just to uh, follow up on that, can you foresee something on, you were also mentioning um, third party, the fact that you can have 
enterprises competing in a third country who does not, for example, have uh, operations or productions in a certain uh, sector and where they would then not be using any of the um, uh, remedies in the WTO, for example, because they did not need it, but the competition is still in that third market would still really be, be un, quote, unfair. Um, and how, how, how would you get more of that third country perspective in, into the rules, which you don't have at this point? Okay, you have immediate responses. <laughs> Wasn't that directed to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of questions. Uh, yeah, whether there is, I, th I think it's an interesting question, but it's it's a it's a it's a bit of a philosophical question here as well because uh, because they uh, and this was ref this is referring to what I was talking about at the beginning is that the international architecture is built around restraining states and what they can do. It's not about restraining the private companies. And one 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 example is that normally a private company can price discriminate. Even if this price discrimination involves, let's say, uh, customers from different countries. That's not against the WTO rules. But if it's a state enterprise, it cannot do so because it can be linked to the state and it's the state that cannot discriminate. So this is just to show that I think in, in principle, philosophically, I agree that, in fact, because there is no guarantee that discrimination or distortions coming from the private sector are any worse. The difference is that they're risking their capital and their investments, and they they, they bearing the consequences. But by we, we've seen a lot of monopolies and and many anti-competitive actions by private enterprises which are resulting in income distribution you know which is not perfect and whatnot so what i'm saying is that in principle both private and state enterprises should be playing according to the same rules and they shouldn't be they, sh they, sh they should be prevented from doing certain things which yield monopolies or you know a discrimination but the question is you now how to define it but the current system is 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 sentient on the states so and i'm uh, here i'm coming back i guess to your to your to your question is you know whether the yes i guess you were referring to the oecd soe guidelines which are a part of the broader architecture of corporate governance uh, kind of you know guidelines of, of the oecd and there I think the different point to be made you know if these are quite uh, good and comprehensive because it they address the whole corporate governance of the state sector, the market conditions, transparency, relationship to the stakeholder, everything. But they are defined with respect to owners owned enterprises. I mean, you could extend it to not owned, let's say minority owned enterprises, as well as national champions, for example. But then you would have to define the national champion. So with these kind of instruments, you always have to have a definition who it applies to, right? And that's the, that's the kind of, that's the kind of, Problem, but corporate governance rules, for example, in general, are for everyone, right? And uh, uh, so I think I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I'm I'm not sure there is a simple answer to your question. And then the third country, I think it it boils down to, yeah, I mean, how do we actually uh, set trade policy today when we have global value chains and we have products and we don't know where they are produced? So. And the, the the kind of trade policy we have now is based on nationality or the, the, you know where it, you know so if I have a, a you know trade remedy policies or any trade policy I define it with respect to the nationality of the product and I can have rules of origin which just help me establish where this product is coming from but with value chains it's really hard to to actually determine and all this all these policies just become some bureaucratic uh, regulations that are at odds with the business but so what you need to uh, what you would need to have to cover the third country effects is to have a, a basically a competition policy for everyone so and then you would ha you didn't have to define borders and what's coming from where if you had let's say 200 countries ag agreeing to the same competition policy let's say eu state aid rules 
and competition policy agreed for everyone, I think that would solve the problem of third markets because they would just you would just uh, you wouldn't have to define the borders and the markets and the jurisdictions. But you know, it's <laughs> Oh, I, I just wanted to to make that uh, comment that yes, of course, we are members as Norway members of several clubs, and I mean there is a division of labor between, for instance, OECD, which is of course doing a lot of important work, uh, developing guidelines, uh, for instance, and and also um, a member of the WTO, and I, I already shared one perspective that we we see this as a, as a more or less a common responsibility for members of that club to to join in in uh, discussions on updates uh, when uh, the need is identified uh, so i think that is also a comment thank you but the uh, for example the OECD SOE guidelines are essentially voluntary for the for the OECD members so it's something that they they aspire to but they don't they don't have to there's no hardcore monitoring or you know discussing the the problems the kind of dispute settlement so i mean the OECD uh, i think is not playing the role it's, it's never tried to play the role the, the kind of role that the WTO is playing so i think that's the although <laughs> i don't know maybe yes Yes, and I think it's it's already ha happening in the transparency, for example, area where the OECD guidelines are mentioned, you know, as a transparency uh, uh, benchmark. Okay, so we <coughs> are slightly on overtime, but we allow one final question from Mr. Jepsen. Yes. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Jan Peter Jepsen, representing Norsk Hydro, which is a global aluminium producing company throughout the whole value chain. Uh, thank you very much for a very enlightening uh, presentation from both of you. Um, I think also I concur with the conclusion that it's the it's not the label SOE which is a problem. It is subsidies which might be linked to uh, state-owned enterprises. And the challenge, I think, is that in certain countries there is difficulties to design or to define where does politics stops and business starts because they are so interlinked uh, in each other. And I think that differs a little bit from Norway to answer the question earlier today, that in the Norwegian uh, system and the model is so transparent. So it is very often easy to define what is a business decision and what is politically influenced of a decision. That is a challenge from other uh, aspects. And to give an example, if you have a, a Chinese company buying another company in Europe, is that a business decision, or is it politically influenced, or is it both? And to define when subsidy starts or business starts, that I think is the challenge to find exactly that borderline. And then uh, to my question, I have actually a question linked to this one too, to the professor is, to what extent do we need to change the VTO rules? Is that on the transparency, the processes on transparency and providing information? Or do you have to look into the actual definition of subsidies, uh, et cetera, to make also the material uh, changes in the rules? Or is it a combination of both rules which need to be changed? Thank you. Okay, so <coughs> the final um, issue to be uh, answered. I'm not a professor, so, but... Uh, <laughs> Want to respond, yeah. Premier, or? Yeah. Uh, How to define when uh, when when politics stops and business starts? I think that that's the, that's the key, that's the key thing, and this is why I don't know if you've seen this report by the European Commission on significant state-induced distortions in the economy of China, which is basically it starts from the political system, the constitution, the Communist Party, and. Yeah, it's 550 pages, but it's it's a long read. But it's it's basically describing, you know, exactly, uh, exactly, you know, how interlinked this is. And but then, you know, every country has got its political system that you know where uh, you know policymakers decide. You know, after all, they are there 
to sometimes, uh, you know, make decisions which are important for business. So then the question is, you know, what kind of political and business system you have and you're okay with in your trading partners. And I think that boils down to the issue, who are you trading with? So if you have very different political system, systems in trading partners, do you have these kind of questions, you know? Where does politics stop? Where do business start? But if you have countries like the EU, for example, which have all these other, you know, rule of law and the whole system converging with each other, there is, there is I think there's few questions about it. So uh, I think it, 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 it comes back to, I think, uh, what I was saying, you know, about the trading blocks. Why, why do countries, certain countries sign trade agreements with these specific other countries and not the others is because they have something in common that they can agree on a, on a set of common rules. So I, th- I think, uh, you know, and this is also plurilateral approaches, you know, it's also showing you that it's also going in the direction that it's not just trade with everyone, it's trade with countries which are relatively similar, where you can understand the division between the politics and business. And then the second question is, you know, whether it's just about the transparency or the rules themselves. But I, I think transparency definitely in the subsidies, notification, and uh, state enterprise notification, but also the rules on subsidies. I mean, in in global value chains, for example, you know, all these different inputs, financing, companies, you know, covering different segments of value chains, getting a subsidy here, maybe getting a trade restriction somewhere there, you know, how does it all add up? It's a, it should be a value chain perspective. And definitely there is something to be said about uh, about the how the, the subsidies are covered in the WTO. But here again, I mean, if you had one state aid and competition policy, uh, that could cover a lot of ground here. Uh, so so, I mean, I agree that it should be the, also the rules that should be looked into and in, in the new 21st century realities. Okay. I can just offer uh, like an observation that we see that there are in parallel uh, proposals uh, about to be made covering both the transparency portion, which is important, and also the uh, looking at more substantive elements. And... Uh, and of course, just one remark on, uh, you mentioned again, plurilateral. I mean, to us, uh, there is plurilateral and then there is plurilateral based on WTO discussions among uh, plurilateral uh, uh, groups based on WTO that may be expanded at a later stage. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I also mentioned that uh, aluminium is one uh, kind of uh, exciting area here, of, also of course also for because of the Norwegian interest, but uh, the OCD is uh, to publish its global study on aluminium. There are discussions in the EU, so this is one of the potential themes that we will cover in future seminars in this series. Uh, so we work on different tracks and keep you posted. Second thing I would just uh, like to add is that uh, this issue is a bit uh, unpleasant in the sense that it's more technical. So we have give, been given a break by Mr. Trump, so tariffs were great again, you know, 10% is very simple and stuff, but, uh, but these regulatory issues which dominate trade policy more and more are important and they affect us and they affect the company, so we have to kind of learn about this. So this was really excellent to, to enlighten us about the, uh, the, the international uh, regimes for, for uh, state enterprises not only the owned enterprise. So I thank the speakers very much and uh, as a token of appreciation and for, um, for, for reading on the flight back to um, Warsaw, you have this uh, copy of this uh, recent book of mine on free trade agreements on gl- and globalization, very expensive. Well, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> and, um, and, and, um, and uh, Mr. Andreasen, he will not fly back to the ministry, but he will fly out of Norway this afternoon. So maybe he will also uh, 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 need, need some reading on the plane. So, so thank you all for attending.